I believe that this is going to be a night that, as Pastor said, lives are changed forever. Someone's eternity is going to be changed forever tonight because of what God does. And I want to get every single one of us ready for that moment. You know, uh, this week we've had several family members in our church really going through a very difficult time. Pastor Susie has a family member who just lost his two children in a car accident. Lester and Nicole lost two children, age one and 16, in a car accident. We had a, a media team member who lost her husband, also a, media, also a volunteer at our church, just died on Monday unexpectedly. They'd been married for six weeks. We had a, a, a relatively new member named Idilio. He just lost his wife of 33 years to COVID. And I know that's only the beginning of the stories that many of us have faced this week. And so I want to challenge us in this moment where the Holy Spirit has filled this room, where the Holy Spirit's power is present and available to begin to lift these people up and intercede. Would you stand with me for a moment? I was going to have you just remain seated, but I feel like we need to get excited. We need to, we need to call down heaven on these folks. We need to pray like this is our father, like this is our mother, like this is our sister. We need to pray for our family right now. There's people that are hurting. There's people that are dying. There's people that do not understand how they're going to make it to tomorrow. And I want to intercede with you for those folks right now. Would you just raise your hands and begin to pray? Father, we ask that you would intervene in every one of these situations, Lord. We don't understand the ins and outs of this. We can't even begin to wrap our minds around the grief and the pain and the sorrow that's here. God, but we know that you are the God of all comfort, and we ask you, God, to be true to your word, to come into every situation, to be near to those brokenhearted, God, and to bring a testimony of Jesus Christ to each family, God. Let people be saved in these moments. Let your word go forth in power and change every situation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Go ahead and have a seat. You might be on your feet in a few more minutes, so just deal with it, all right? But I do want to honor my pastor. You know, I don't know how many of you guys have been here uh, for, you know, longer than 15 years, but every single one of us, whether we've been here 15 years or 15 minutes, can honestly say that they have been blessed and have received so much from the sacrifice of our pastors, Pastor Marco, Pastor Lisa, they've sacrificed, they've paid the price to be here in San Bernardino to see lives change. They love us. They have blessed my life in more ways than one. If that's true in your life, would you just give a round of applause and some honor to our pastors? We love you. We have the best pastors in the world. We're so grateful. I'm, I'm beyond blessed to be here sharing this pulpit tonight with these amazing people. And I want to just get into a word tonight. You know, I just got back from Africa uh, just a few days ago. Where's my Africa team at? All right. All right. I knew I could count on you guys. We had an amazing time. And God spoke in so many ways. But one thing that I really took away was how God uses the broken places of our lives to heal the broken places of others. He uses those places in our lives that we don't really even understand. There's things in my life I still don't understand, but God can use those things to heal someone else's pain, to take them to a place of faith and hope that they would not have without your story. And tonight's message is for anyone who is struggling, facing a painful situation that you can't see your way out of. If you're hurting, if you're broken, if you're confused, if you've gone through a loss this week, then you have found yourself in exactly the right place tonight. Because I believe that God has a word for you. I believe that there is a word for you tonight that will, left, that will leave you feeling encouraged and excited about what God is doing in this season. The title of my message tonight is Jesus is Enough. I want to just uh, have you help me say that. When I say Jesus is, you say enough. Jesus is. Jesus is. Jesus is. Second Corinthians chapter 12, past, we got Paul, the apostle, talking. He's telling us about a really painful situation in his life that he's prayed for repeatedly that God would take. Has anyone got a situation that you've prayed for repeatedly? Maybe it's a sickness in your body. Maybe it's a loved one that you've been praying for that God would heal or, or that, that God would save. Maybe it's a situation that uh, at work, someplace that there's just a conflict that is constant 
and you prayed and you prayed and you prayed. Well, Paul was in one of those situations in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. This is what God says to him after Paul begging God, God, take this away from me. Jesus, or God, says this to Paul, but he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My loving kindness and my mercy are more than enough. Say enough. Always available, regardless of the situation, for my power is being perfected and is completed and shows itself most effectively in your weakness. Therefore, I will all the more gladly boast in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may completely enfold me and may dwell in me. I love that last part. So that the power of Christ may completely envelop me, enfold me, and dwell within me. I don't like as much the fact that it has to happen in my weakness. Wouldn't it be wonderful if God's power could be made perfect in our goodness? Wouldn't it be wonderful if God's power could be made perfect while we live a happy, carefree life? While we're going to Disneyland or Knott's Berry Farm? Wouldn't that be great? But unfortunately, that's not the way this goes. His power is made perfect in the dry place. His power is made perfect in the weak place. His power is made perfect when you're facing a situation that you cannot understand. That is when God's power is enough. Jesus is, Jesus is, Jesus is. You know, the book of 2 Corinthians is very interesting. I spent about six hours reading it last night. I was talking to Pastor Marco about it. But all through the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about some of the darkest moments in his ministry, some of the most difficult situations that he faced as a Christian and as a minister. And one example of that is in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 to 9. It's one of the darkest moments. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Has anyone been there in this room? Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us, what, rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So Paul, in a situation where he literally feels like death is imminent, it's a drastic, dire circumstance. Paul can't understand it. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He's coming to a point where he literally thinks he's going to die, and his only hope, his only point of faith is, if I do die, I know God could raise me from the dead. It's in that place that Paul begins to learn the most important lesson of his life. It's the lesson I want us all to learn here tonight. His grace is enough. Jesus is enough. This, uh, this trip to Africa, I met a young man named Sammy. Sammy's about 28, 29 years old. He's a driver. And uh, I happen to just see Sammy standing in a crowd. I didn't even know that he was a part of uh, the, the crew that was helping us uh, over the course of our time there. And I went and I spoke with Sammy and Sammy began to pour his heart out to me. He started telling me about this really dramatic church problem he was going through. You see, his father-in-law, his wife's father, was the pastor of their church. And a couple years ago, his father-in-law passed away. Well, as soon as that happened, three or four different factions arose in their church and began to try to take over that church, began to try to take over the offerings, began to try to take over the control and direction of the church. And he and his wife were left on the outside. In fact, it got so bad that there was a group of people who actually were praying and fasting that his children would die. That's a pretty dire circumstance. That's a pretty painful situation. And I was able to sit there with Sammy and pray with Sammy for just a few minutes. And all I could say to him is this, Jesus is enough. You see, I've been walking, I've walked through some situations like Sammy has, and I'm going to share it in a little bit. 
But I had an opportunity to speak just some hope and some faith into Sammy, and I want to speak that same hope and faith into you. It does not matter if you understand the situation that you're in. It does not matter how dark and painful it has become. It does not matter if every single person you relied on has now become your enemy. Jesus is enough to see you through it. This verse talks about the grace of God being sufficient for us, the grace of God being enough for us, and I want you to know that Jesus is God's grace to us. Jesus is the grace of God. I'm going to skip by this definition and just get straight to a couple of verses that talk about how Jesus is the grace of God. John 1.16, it says, Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness. Titus 2.11 says, For the remarkable undeserved grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Grace is found only in one place. The power that we need, the strength that we need, the hope that we need, as Pastor described that tonight, it's found only in one place. It's found in Jesus Christ. And Jesus is enough. 2 Peter 1.3 says it this way, God's power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowing the one who has called us to his own glory and goodness. I, I rededicated my life to the Lord in 2007. I had been raised in the church, but I had been running from God for over 10 years. At the time that I walked into the church doors, I was addicted to drugs, abusing alcohol, sexually immoral, and on trial for assault. I'd literally been in jail the weekend before. I was not going to church to surrender my life to God. I was literally just hoping I would find some people who were playing bingo on the weekend. I was hoping that there might be a couple people playing Scrabble instead of smoking bowls and drinking like I had been every day for more than six months. I walked into those, that church in a broken state. I didn't even think I want, I didn't even think God would want me. And I recall being in a worship service, not unlike what we experienced tonight, where God was moving in a dramatic fashion. People were being saved and set free. Demons were manifesting in me. And I began to raise my hands in a moment of pure surrender. And I said to God, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I'm going to live the way that you want me to live. I'm going to do the things that you want me to do. No matter what it costs me, I'm going to live for you. And in that moment, the grace of God, the love of God, the power of God came down into my heart, surrounded me in a way that I cannot adequately express to you today. I knew that I was called to the ministry. I'd been called to the ministry at a young age. So I got to my pastor and I said, Pastor, I'm ready. I've surrendered. I just prayed this awesome prayer over there. And he said, cool. So what do you want me to say? I said, well, what's next? How do I, how do I, how do I serve? What do I do? Are you going to give me a job or what? <laughs> He's like, didn't you just tell us you were in jail last weekend? <laughs> but he said, well, let's start here, Mike. Um, how much are you praying I said, I pray all the time. I pray every morning, every night. I pray for my meals. I pray without ceasing, Pastor. I never stop praying. He said, okay, cool. So when? When do you pray? What do you mean? Well, do you have a time that you set aside that you actually spend some time with Jesus? Just like a set time. I said, like a set time, Pastor? Yeah, a set time. I said, I don't have that. He said, well, I think you need to set uh, a time every morning that you're going to spend one hour in prayer. I said, I can't pray for 15 minutes. <laughs> what, what do you pray about for an hour? He, he kind of laughed it off and gave me some, some tools. And I can't tell you that I started praying for an hour that morning. But some him over the course of the last, you know, the next couple of weeks, I decided I would put that to the test. And I began a time that I set aside every day to get to know Jesus. And I can't say I did it perfectly. I can't say I had that full hour fixed right from the start, but over the last 14 years, I've dedicated at least one hour of my morning every day to walking with Jesus, to talking with Jesus, to spending time in dedicated worship, to studying his word, to getting to know the one who had called me to his glory and his goodness. And I want to tell you guys that Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. So how do we learn that Jesus is enough? And I've got just a limited time, so I'm going to go through this quickly. 
But the first way is what I just described, in time alone with him. You know, in Luke chapter 10, there's two sisters we're all very familiar with, Mary and Martha. They're close friends with Jesus. They invite Jesus over to the home. Jesus is sitting in the living room. Mary is sitting at his feet. Martha's running around like a chicken with her head cut off, trying to serve. She's getting the drinks ready, getting the refreshments ready, making sure the house is clean. At some point, she gets upset. She's looking at Mary sitting at Jesus' feet and starts to feel a little envious. She goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, this isn't right. Mary's sitting here enjoying time with you while I'm doing all the work. Have her get up and help me. It says in Luke chapter 10, verses 41 and 42, but the Lord replied to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered and anxious about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, that which is to her advantage, and it will not be taken away from her. Another translation says, only one thing is required. Only one thing is needed. It's sitting at the feet of Jesus. And I want to challenge you, if you don't take anything else from today's message, take this. Dedicate some time to be with Jesus. Dedicate some part of your day, every day, to be at the feet of Jesus, to worship him, to pray, to study his word, to get to know the one who has called you. And your life will be more full. And your life will have the power that you need to walk through circumstances that you otherwise can't understand. We started tonight talking about being in the weak place, in a place where you don't understand and you can't see your way out. And I'm telling you that if you haven't spent that time with Jesus, you'll never make it out of that moment. There was a time in my life just a year or so after I started the full-time ministry, I somehow convinced that pastor to hire me. He hired me for room and board. I worked uh, for $50 a week, and slept in a closet in our church. It was the best job I've ever had. Until coming to the Wayworld Outreach, of course. But, you know, a year after uh, joining the ministry, I was diagnosed with diabetes. No one in my family really had diabetes. I was a, a really out of left field. I didn't understand what was happening. My blood sugar levels were all over the place, and I will spare you the gruesome details of what that looks like in your body, but there was a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. I was in and out of hospital rooms, in and out of urgent care and emergency rooms for a while, trying to figure out how to manage things. And it was about, I don't know, two, three weeks into this that I found myself alone in a hospital room waiting for another doctor to come and see me. And the only thing that could, that could come to my mind in that moment was, I believe. You're my healer. I believe you're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all I need. After a year of spending that hour with Jesus, I knew that my only hope in that moment was in him. I knew that the only thing that was going to get me through was him. I had no other hope, no other strength, no other resource to draw from but a relationship with Jesus. And I want you to know that Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. Which brings us back to our verse for the night, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. I'll show it to you in the, tr the Passion Translation. It says, my grace is always more than enough for you. My power finds its full expression through your weakness. So I will celebrate my weaknesses for when, I, when I'm weak, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Christ living in me. How many of you want to sense the power of Christ living within you? How many of you want to know that Jesus is there, that he's an intimate friend, that he's got a resource that you can draw on? How many of you want to know that Jesus is walking through that day with you, that week with you, that month with you, that he's in your workplace, that he's in your home, that he's in your family? We all want that. But not many of us want the weakness that it requires. Not many of us want the pain that it requires for us to learn and feel that mighty power within us. Just a few years ago, at the end of my time in San Francisco, which is where I was in ministry, I was there for 10 years serving at that church. Our uh, youth pastor, the, the pastor's son, was our youth pastor. He had an affair with one of the teenage girls in our youth group. Shortly thereafter, he divorced his wife. And shortly after that, our lead pastor and his wife divorced as well. It was an ugly time. 
It was a time that I was able to tell Sammy about in Africa because a church split was on the horizon. Things got really bad. The board came to me shortly after that, said, give us your keys. Don't ever come back to this church again. I'd served for 10 years. I'd built quality friendships, relationships with the people there. I lived at that church. So I lost my job, my home, my church, friends and family, all in the span of a few seconds. And one question was left in my mind. Is Jesus enough? Is his grace enough? You see, I didn't know where to go from there. I didn't know what the next chapter was supposed to look like. Nobody had a playbook for me. Nobody had a blueprint laid out for me. I ended up down in Mexico, literally in the desert. There were more cactuses there than people. I was walking every morning in the hot Mexican sun, wondering if God had put me on the shelf forever. Nobody's calling me pastor. They'd already taken that away. Nobody was asking me for a ministry. I didn't speak the language. The only thing I did was pray and dig holes for palm trees. That was my ministry. And I can remember so many of those moments, so many of those days getting up and just saying, God, is this all? God, is this, is this how my life is supposed to end? Am I, am I just supposed to stay here? I've, I've gone from a church which had a you know, couple thousand people in a week to a church of 20. And 15 of them were my family members. And I was wondering what God was doing. I was wondering, is Jesus enough? And I want you to walk away tonight knowing one thing, that when it's all stripped away, when your title, your job, your health, your family, when the things that you found your identity in are taken from you, will you be able to say, Jesus is enough? Jesus is enough. I can tell you from experience, having walked through that desert, that Jesus is enough. You see, right at the, uh, at the, at the most crucial point of that transition in my life, I emailed a few people trying to find out maybe there's something out there for me. I emailed a bishop in India. He's a head of over 500 churches there, and I'd visited him a number of times. Loved his, loved his heart, loved his church. And uh, I wrote a really long email. And those of you who know me know when I say really long, I mean like a really long email. Two to three hours I wrote this email. I mean, I was long, Pastor. I, was, <laughs> I really wanted him to know what was going on. He... He emailed me back one line. I was a little upset. The line said, you're being promoted. I said, I just got fired. I just lost my job. I just lost my church. I just lost my home. I'm not being promoted. That's the opposite of what's happening here. But after a year and a half of walking through the desert with nothing more than Jesus, no one else to talk to. No one else to pour my heart out to. No one else to turn to. I can tell you that I was being promoted because God brought me to the Wayworld Outreach. <laughs> A place of ministry that I couldn't have dreamed of while I was walking in that desert. I could not have imagined the thing that God was going to do in my life. And I wish I could say I did it all right and that's why I'm here, but it's not. It's because his grace is sufficient. It's because Jesus is enough. It has nothing to do with how great I did in that moment. I made all kinds of mistakes, but I can tell you this, Jesus is enough. I wanna close with one more thing here. It's uh, the story of my grandfather, you know, right on the heels actually of being fired from my, my former church and losing everything, my grandfather, my second father passed away. And I was in the hospital with him one night, the very last night that I had to speak with him. And I was so proud of him. He'd been fielding all kinds of phone calls from family members all over the place. He was tired, but he never stopped loving and caring for every family member that came through while he was dying. 
And I remember looking at him and saying, Grandpa, you're so strong. And my grandfather shook his head, and he said, No, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Ephesians 2.8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved, and Jesus is God's grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. And I'm grateful that my grandfather taught me that lesson. You see, my grandpa had learned a lesson I wish that we would all learn tonight. It's that his grace is enough. His grace is sufficient for me. Jesus is enough. When I say Jesus is enough, I'm not saying that everything makes sense right now. I'm not saying that every story has a happy ending on this side of eternity. I'm not saying I understand all the pain that I've, I've had to walk through or that you're walking through right now. There's those prayer requests that I, I laid before us today that I can't understand. I don't understand what's happening there. But I am saying that this, in this life, in this journey, in this process, Jesus can be and always will be enough. Jesus can be and always will be enough. Jesus is enough when you're hurting. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4 says, he is the God of all comfort who comforts us in our afflictions. Jesus is enough when you're full of anxiety. Philippians 4, 7 says that he is a peace of God that surpasses all understanding and that he will guard your heart and mind. Jesus is enough when you're afraid. Deuteronomy 31, 6 says that he will be with you, that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus is enough when you're brokenhearted. Psalm 34, 18 says he will be close to you when you're brokenhearted. Psalm 147, 3 says he will heal your broken heart and bind up every wound. Jesus is enough when you're stressed out. 1 Peter 5, 7 says I can cast all all my cares upon him because he cares for me. Jesus is enough when you are weak. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says his power is made perfect in that weakness. Isaiah 40, 29 says he'll give you strength when you're weary and power when you're weak. Jesus is enough when you're tired. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says that you can go to him when you're weary and heavy laden and he'll give you rest. Jesus is enough when you're all alone. Psalm 68, 5 to 6 says he's a father to the fatherless, that he sets the lonely in families. And Proverbs 18, 24 says he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Jesus is enough. Jesus is. Jesus is. Jesus is. Would you stand to your feet if you know that Jesus is enough? We're going to close right now, but I want to just throw this out. If you've been walking through a season of darkness, of suffering, of pain without Jesus, tonight that story is about to change. If you've been going through some situations and recognizing that you have not been turning to the only source, the only strength, the only power that can carry you through in Jesus Christ, tonight you can, you can change that story. You can turn to him. You can find in him the resource. You know, the Bible is very clear that Jesus also suffered. He suffered a gruesome death on a cross. He suffered malicious beatings at the hands of Roman soldiers in the Sanhedrin. He was spit on. He was mocked. He went through the, more, the most agonizing death known to man at that time. Why? Why? So that he could be the all-sufficient power, the all-sufficient grace, the all-sufficient strength of God in your situation. He paid a price to know you. He paid a price to be your resource. He paid a price to be enough for every one of us in this room. When I say Jesus is enough, it's not just a cliche. It's not just some clever saying. It's not just something that we need to walk out of here clapping about. It's something that needs to change your very life. It's something that you need to come to terms with. Am I going to accept that Jesus is enough or am I going to reject his power, his strength, his resource? If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've not invited his power, his strength, his resource into your life, tonight is the night for you to do so.
Tonight is the night for you to say, I am done living my way. I'm done living with my strength and my resource. I'm too weak to do this on my own. I need a savior. I need Jesus in my life. We're not going to spend a ton of time dragging this out. If you need Jesus in your life, you know you need the strength. You need the power that only he can offer. I want you to raise your hand in this place. If you know you need Jesus and you've not had him in your life as you should, whether you're rededicating tonight, whether you're coming to him for the first time, go ahead and put that hand up high. Wave it. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Let me see those hands again on this side. I see that hand. Jesus is enough. I want to ask you to do one more thing. Every one of you who's raised your hand, who said, I want Jesus in my life. I need the strength of Jesus. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. Would you come forward right now? Come forward right now. Let's give it up for them, guys. Every single one of these people is making a choice. to make Jesus the center of their life, to make Jesus the resource that they need. Our altar workers are here to pray with you. If you're, if you're not someone who's surrendering your life for the first time, but you are someone who's going through a difficult season, if you're going through a trial that you don't understand, if you're going through pain that you have yet to come to terms with, if you're dealing with the loss of a loved one or sickness in your body or any other struggle, I want you to also come forward. There's altar workers here. We would love to the honor to pray with you. Please don't leave here tonight without availing yourself of the resource and the power of Jesus Christ. But we got quite a few here who are giving their lives to Jesus right now. We've got quite a few here who are making Jesus their resource, maybe for the first time in their life. I want you guys to do the honor of praying this prayer with me. And then our altar workers are gonna pray with you and they're gonna give you some instructions on what your next step is. Your next step is gonna be starting out the way. Starting out the way is gonna be your next step, but it starts right here with a prayer of surrender to invite Jesus' power into our lives. Would you bow your heads with me and allow me to pray? Just go ahead and repeat after me. Jesus, I surrender. Jesus, I want your power. Jesus, I need your strength. Come into my life. Take over the control. Take over my life and be the Lord. Be the savior of my life. I want to live for you. I want to live with you. I want to know you. And in your name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.